Hey, attorney Brian Parker here again. Um, this week and the last couple of weeks has morphed into how to create the account to affidavit and how important it is, is it follows you from the documents of the other side, you use the documents against them into the counter affidavit to create your defense and supporting documents. There's the jumps into your answer and affirmative defenses. And then that jumps into your counterclaim and beyond. And then I thought, wait a minute, there's another use for the counter affidavit. A lot of clients come to me with a default against them or they're receiving garnishment notices on stuff they have no clue how they were started and the, usually the first notice they receive is either their bank is calling to say you've got no funds or they're getting uh, letters in the mail saying we're going to be coming after you because you we have a default against you so the counter affidavit is everything as always because you know I'm a big fan of the counter affidavit your goal when you are setting aside a uh, judgment or a uh, default is to get your day in court and that's a term of art in most states you've got to say uh, this default was wrongfully held against me and if given the chance I could show you how I could win this case so if you're defaulted on debt you clearly own and uh, there's really no defense but you've got this default and you were never served with a lawsuit Depending on the state you're in, for example, in Michigan, you have to show a good faith reason why you didn't answer, didn't get the lawsuit. Also, that you have a meritorious defense. A lot of states require that, that if we go and you set aside this default, Your Honor, I'll show you why I don't owe this debt to this guy. And of course, I know my way around whatever this situation is. And I believe if you've got the default, you have your right to your day in court. And that's the goal of the counter affidavit. So um, just like what I talked about in my previous video and the videos before that, the counter affidavit in this case plunks eventually into the answer and your affirmative defenses and counterclaim if you win the set aside motion to set aside the default. There's a lot of plunking going on, but again, the importance of the counter affidavit, I, I can't uh, discount it, it's, it's everything. So there are 10 things you wanna look at when you're setting aside a default with a counter affidavit. Number one, and we'll put it up one at a time, proof of service. Go to the court when you find out about this, timing is everything, pull the file and does the proof of service say you were served on the day you weren't there clearly you've got them or does it say you're five for ten and blonde when you really look like me uh, i'm pretty close to five ten but um it ain't me i'm not blonde i never was i'm more gray so you got them number two the proof of service is how the default was served upon you a default has to be served on the other side or someone that you are holding in default at their previous known address, however you did that. But it's gotta be shown in your proof of service how it was sent to you and sent to the court. If that's false, you got them. You, timing is everything, remember I said that, create an objection to any garnishment execution on the default, whether it be with your bank, your employer, or someone trying to put something on your house, the object, objection timing is everything. Number four, make sure you allege in your affidavit when you first learned about the debt and if or when you actually received the lawsuit. Normally, if you did and you went to court, like I told you, to go grab the lawsuit, put that in your counter affidavit. Be human. I went to court. I had no idea what this was about. I pulled the court file and there was this lawsuit I'd never seen before. Now I have it and that ain't me. Five, allege in your affidavit all the work and time and effort you went through to get this thing set aside and all the efforts because the court's going to want to know if you spent money, if you were damaged in some way, especially if you go to federal court. I've done videos on that. 
Always allege why you don't owe the debt. You have to produce a meritorious defense in Michigan and generally everywhere else. The court's going to want to know, but hey, do you owe the debt? Again, Parker's rule is I, even if I owe the debt, Your Honor, I don't owe it to this guy. And if I haven't seen the lawsuit, I can't give you a, a good opinion on that anyway. Um, I counsel you that you can self-notarize in a lot of these counter affidavits under a federal rule. When it's something like setting aside a default and you're literally telling the court, whoops, you made a ruling that was wrong, no fault of your own, Your Honor, you've got to do it on, in front of a notary. So it increases or improves your indicia of reliability. A notary it watches you sign and it's you and you're authorizing under oath with your hand up why you did not receive the complaint as stated and the debt is not yours. So it should be notarized in front of a notary. Number eight, attach a police report. Let's be honest, if, you're, if this is an ID theft, why wouldn't you have a police report, you know? Regardless who you probably know who did it, and by the way, eight times, a ten, it's out, eight times out of 10, it's usually your brother-in-law, your wife, your husband. It's amazing how many of those cases I have the proximity of the thief to the person that I represent. It's kind of sad. Number nine, remember, do the job that you're seeking to, your goal is to get this thing set aside. Your greater goal is to get your day in court. So remember that. Make sure you frame your affidavit in a way that answers their allegations. And then number 10, that's pervasive throughout these 10. I'm giving it its own number. Timing is everything. The longer you wait to do something about this, the more the case, the more the court is skeptical. Because if this was truly as you allege, that, whoa, what a surprise, this isn't mine. The court knows as a human being, the court brings its experiences and its humanness to any decision that you would have acted real fast on this if it wasn't yours. That's not necessarily true. There are reasons. Sometimes clients come to me three months later after this and go, well, I tried to work it out with the attorney. I did some research. And that's reasonable if that's, but put that in your affidavit as to why you didn't do it right away. Or if you did do it right away, I immediately went to court. I immediately did this. I immediately filed a police report. The court does listen to this. I'll give you a couple of examples, all right? So let's put up the first one, Cindy Shazam. Uh, I represented that client who hadn't lived in a certain place for 10 years. And then they served him a lawsuit and a default at the place he lived at 10 years ago in a court and a, and, a, and a county he didn't live in. So that's what I said and what they did. And one of the things I said in my top 10 tips uh, it's important that you remember to improve or have uh, your state ID, have it be current. The, because if it isn't, and it's actually the old address that they served, the debt collector can make a good faith argument that they served it to the least last known address. So you should kind of keep up with that stuff and make sure your state ID reflects your actual uh, address as in this one I'm showing you now that my client lived so far away from the court where he was sued and defaulted. This is one of those cases, it's a rare thing. The judge got involved. They're not supposed to, but they are human, as I said. And he said, Go get an attorney, do this, you will win if you do a set aside. And he was tipping off the other side too who, because they're very reasonable and smart people, said, we're going to immediately set... No, they didn't. <laughs> debt collectors aren't smart or reasonable in that regard. You owe the debt to them. So um, he hired me, and I had him out of that. And he was a very happy person. Very quickly, we didn't have to go back to court. So that's an example of one against a credit court, credit court solutions, who had no solutions, just problems. Uh, a second one is a base, Shazam is based on identity theft. And that's a client that hired me for, after Discover Bank. Um, actually, she was living with the gentleman 
and he just robbed her. As I was telling you about identity theft, it's usually the proximity of the person that does this to you is real close. It's sad. And in this case, they were living together, and he just, she's got a number of debts out there uh, because of this person. And in 2018, she got sued for a debt that wasn't hers. She contacted uh, Discover, and they said, hey, we get it. It happens. No problem. We'll take care of it. So they took care of it. No, they didn't. <laughs> Don't expect corporations to look out for you. So that start, she started getting garnishment notices and her taxes were taken. And that's what that's talking about in the second one I've got up in front of you. And so I had to have her do a very good police report and also state exactly what I said about her boyfriend. She was wrongfully uh, imposed upon by this debt. Here's the sad part of this. She's hoping to become an attorney. So she's actually paying some of these debts off that aren't hers. She figured, hey, when I get in front of the board to tell them I, I'm a good candidate to be a, an attorney, I want my record clean. So rather than go take the time and do protect herself, she just started making payments on these debts. And she was going to do the same thing with this debt she brought to me, but she ran out of money to cover this guy's debts. It's, it can get... Nine out of ten of these are just sad. Sometimes when I finally reveal the truth to the victim, I don't hear from them again. Uh, it's it's kind of sad that people do that to their relatives. So that's an example there of an identity theft affidavit. Uh, I'm pointing to the, that first one and that second affidavit all on my membership website, attached as templates so you can use to conform to your facts and law. I'll give you a quick third one. This is one where the gentleman, it's another one of those where he hadn't lived in the place for years. His state ID, it was this, he hadn't changed his state ID to the place they sued him in. He'd only lived there for two years. He always lived with his parents essentially before he moved to his own place. And his state ID reflected this. There was the bank and the law firm had no business coming after him. So they took a large chunk of money. I've never seen this before from his bank account. That's the money he was saved up for years as a waiter trying to buy a house. And they took it right before he started the process after years of saving. He didn't know about this lawsuit. And by the time they did get to suing him and doing everything, they'd passed the statute of limitations. So that number three reflects that it's a Johnny-come-lately default where they, the debt collector sued on a very old debt and they later admitted to me, yeah, it's junk, we shouldn't have done that. They're never going to admit that. But because what they did is they did the most reasonable thing. They immediately tried to set it aside and help. No, they didn't. I had to file, even though it was clear he was on the right, I had to file a motion to set aside had to sue them in federal court, had to do a counterclaim. They ran me through the ringer. And the guy had, was well past the statute of limitation. And that's the thing about arrogance and debt collectors. They will not admit they're wrong unless you've got the smoking gun, which I try to have. And then they go, well, we'll save some money. We'll work it out. Like they never admit their mistakes. So that's the third one. That's an identity theft, sort of. The actual guy that co-signed on this loan that my client did take. It's not identity theft other than that they had him living somewhere else and it was well beyond the statute of limitations. The person on the loan died. My client was his nephew and now he's cleaning up, sort of cleaning up the mess, well beyond the statute of limitations. So they sued him anyway, started garnishing. Uh, he Got, I got his money back, and by the way, they took forever giving it back, even though they're supposed to give it right back. He took that money, and he did, after all these years as a waiter and working his butt off as a student, he bought his first house. So that's nice for me when I get good feedback like that, and now we're going after him in federal court. So that's how you use a counter affidavit another way. Once a lawsuit has been defaulted, and that's your finding out about it, I've given you three examples. They're on my collection stopper solutions 
Dot-com membership website chock full of videos and templates I'll put three up there today and I'll also put a my show notes so you can see my top 10 things you need to do to set aside a default which you then when you're successful you take that same counter after David drop it into your answer drop it into your affirmative defenses and your counterclaim of beyond Again, the point of my other video, other videos on this is all the work is done for you using their documents. And once you've got that counter affidavit, it follows you all the way through whatever task you have. So it isn't as hard as you think it is, at least in a debt collection context. I hope this is helpful. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, love, like, subscribe, and we'll keep banging away. Thank you.